keep your filthy hands off of my college football, all right? Welcome into the Hard Count, the people's program for every single thing that we all know and love about this beautiful sport. If you can't tell already, we got some feelings about the rule changes that are potentially going to be in play. They've just been proposed at the time of us being live. They are not yet set in stone. We talked about it a little bit yesterday in one of our one-off videos. I want us to all circle up and just have a conversation about this as a family with what this would mean for college football and maybe some other solutions. Hey, I don't know if this is the only way to shorten games. In fact, I know this is not the only way to shorten games. Got some feelings, some concerns, some thoughts on that one. Coach Shane Beamer joining the program today, head football coach over there at South Carolina. You think about culture, you think about juice, you think about energy, you think about upsets. And he told us, yeah, we're not just wanting to be a good story at South Carolina. We have bigger aspirations than just a couple of upsets. So talk to him. He had some phenomenal things to say. Really, really awesome conversation. We appreciate him taking time to talk to us. Going to air that conversation here in just a few minutes. Also, the SEC, the winds of change are blowing down there in the Southeastern Conference. There's a lot of takes out there about scheduling, how it could look, different rivalries that could be in play that won't be in play anymore. I feel like the rivalries of college football to me are just like the natural resources. Like we got to protect some of those at all costs. We can't let big business come in here and put a parking lot where we have a national treasure. So I have a short list of rivalries that I think we just have to protect. We just have to keep these intact as we move into a new scheduling model. And then the on three staff put together a top 10 players list in college football heading into 2023. So we're not considering Bryce Young or CJ Stroud. This is looking forward to players that will be active in the approaching season. Going to break down that list just a little bit, give you some of my thoughts and some players that could be on boom watch. We've talked about boom watch here a couple times. It just essentially means we think they could finish higher at the end of the 2023 season on that list to where they are at the beginning of the season. But nonetheless, y'all know the deal here, man. College football doesn't take breaks. This show does not either. We're so fired up to have you here again. Shane Beamer about to be on the program here in just a few short minutes at the end of this thing. We went to my Twitter page, at Judy Pakel, got some of your thoughts, feelings, concerns. Nick Brake about to get after it there. Before we get to Shane Beamer, though, I want us to just hit the pause button and talk about the proposed rule changes, according to Sports Illustrated's Ross Dellinger, that are potentially in play for college football. There is four of them. Two of them are apparently getting some traction. We talked about it yesterday, but allow me to repeat myself. The first two are this. One, no consecutive timeouts. What does that mean? No more icing the kicker. If you got three timeouts, you get to call one of those before he kicks the field goal, and then we go from there. You don't get to spend all three and make that 21-year-old think about this 40-yard field goal that is going to potentially change his life. Feels like a strategy play. I'm not for it. That's one that's in play. The other that's getting some traction is no longer extending an untimed down in the first or third quarter. So a play happens in the first quarter. There's a penalty. They're not replaying that with double zeros left in the first quarter. They're just moving that thing on to the second quarter. Again, a lot of the hope in these rules is to shorten the game at the college football level and to make these broadcasts a little more digestible. I got some feelings. We're going to talk about it. Clock only stops inside of two minutes on a first down. So that's one of the big, big changes between college football and the NFL. Typically, whenever you get a first down now, those no huddle offenses, they get to reset, they get to get set, and all the while, the clock is not running. You have to wait until the ball is spotted for that clock to start running. They're saying, clock's going to run like the NFL until we get inside of two minutes. I'm not for it. I've said it before, strategy advantage. The Tennessees of the world, the old Oregon offenses under Chip Kelly, UCLA right now under Chip Kelly feels like a strategy play, but they want to change that to, again, shorten the game. The fourth one, which is apparently the most controversial right now among these circles that deal with rules, restarting the clock when the ball is spotted after an incompletion. Now, that's not even football. Like, I don't even understand where that came from. We're really pushing the needle here if we want to shorten these games. I'm not for it. Now, I went to my Twitter page and I thought, am I crazy? Am I the only one here thinking that these rules are just a bad idea? I want to hear from y'all. I put a poll out on my Twitter page. I checked it right before we went live. 
and I said, are you for or against these rules? What do we think? 85% of you of 424 plus votes said, nah, we're good. We don't want to change the rules, which really to me just made me feel good. But there's a bigger point I'm trying to make here in relation to these rules, which is that it feels like we keep trying to make college football like the NFL. And my question is why? We like college football because it's college football. If we wanted to watch the NFL, we would wait till Sunday, sit down and watch the NFL games. And that's fine. I am not against the NFL. I said it on this very show yesterday. I am not anti-NFL. I sat down. I watched Patrick Mahomes and Jalen Hurts get after it in the Super Bowl, and I was happy as a clam. But I love college football. And I want my college football to be uniquely college football. I don't want my college football to look like the NFL. People who like spicy food, they like spicy food because it's spicy. You don't order buffalo wings and then hope it tastes like barbecue. If you like barbecue, that's fine. You can have barbecue. But we don't need to water down buffalo to make it less spicy for the people to enjoy in a larger scale. How many of you know this? When something is special it might not be for everybody right like college football doesn't need to have a wider audience there is a ton of people an enormous audience that watch college football and will continue to watch college football happily this is no knock on the nfl i think the concern that i have is we are trying to find a solution to something and we're taking the wrong approach like if the hope is here to grow fans changing the rules ain't gonna do it if you watch the NFL over college football, you watch the NFL because you'd rather watch Eagles versus Giants than Texas and OU. That's okay. That's fine. We're not going to get those fans to come watch our game just because we made it a little bit shorter. That's not going to swing that diehard Eagles fan to go watch Texas OU or to go watch Temple or to go watch insert whatever college football team here. If you like the NFL... There's no swaying you. Same thing with college football. You can enjoy both, but you are specifically loyal more often than not to either the college or the professional game. Now, I won't be ignorant and say there's not overlap there just a little bit, but you hear what I'm saying. Shortening the game, changing these rules, we're not going to draw in a wider audience. That, this is not the way to do it. You know it, I know it, and in their heart of hearts, I even think the people proposing these rules, I think they know it. The other issue I have... When we're changing the rules like this, none of it has to do with the game itself. It's all about people that are exchanging dollar bills and wearing suits and ties to work. Like, it's not about the game itself. I could go down a rabbit hole into the college football playoff. I won't do it because I have my own feelings and concerns about that, that I would say have the same reasoning as I do about this. None of this is about player safety. None of this is about having a more equal outcome. None of this is about leveling the playing field. All of this is about how can we put more dollar bills in our pockets and try to add just a little bit more fans. Again, I told you, it's not going to add more fans. Like on the large scale, we're not going to see a huge uptick because the game is three hours as opposed to three hours and 45 minutes or three and a half hours. That's not going to get you new fans. And it's not about the game. It's about the people exchanging money. Now, I would also say this. I understand this is what it's about. I understand that money is what makes these broadcasts go. It's what causes college football to be the monster that it is. I get that. You're not telling me anything new by saying, well, JD, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but it's never going to happen, bro. It's about money. I hear you, but let's just get on our soapbox here a little bit. Protect college football from becoming the NFL. I'll say what I said on this platform yesterday. I'll say it again today. You want to shorten broadcasts? You want to go from having a three and a half hour game to a three hour game? You want to do that? I'll tell you how to do that. You cut one commercial from every break. Boom. Done. And that's it. And that'll shorten your game. Now, I understand there's too much money involved. It's not going to happen. But if that was really the hope, if the hope was really to make these broadcasts shorter so you could get more fans, it's one way to do it. You don't need to have the clock running after an incompletion. That's just the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. All right, so let's keep college, college. Let's keep NFL, NFL. We don't need to have them look the same. We love them because they're different. 
We don't need to open the gates and, and widen the, the reach for college football fans to go grab other people that aren't even interested in the sport. If you love college football, you love college football. If you love the NFL, you love the NFL. A couple of rule changes, that's not going to get it done, man. That's not going to get it done. So again, we are not only against just a couple of these rules, we're against all of these rules. College football is college football. The NFL is the NFL. I hope I haven't been unclear. To the NFL fans watching this, subscribe if you haven't already. We love y'all. We're glad that you're a part of this. College football fans, if you haven't subscribed yet, we'd love to have you a part of this as well. We talk college football here every single day, live twice a week. As you can tell, we're passionate about this. But I very much so hope that these rules don't go into effect. So I'll just leave it at that. Seeing those rules, though, like reading them, the first two, you're kind of like, ah, I wouldn't like that, but those aren't that extreme. And then you start reading the clocks running after it in completion. You're like, dude, what are we doing? What are, what are we doing here? What is this all about? Just makes no sense to me. I don't get it. But nonetheless, the party rolls on. Now, we got to talk to Coach Shane Beamer, spend a little bit of time with us. And let me tell you, all he is phenomenal. Like he has South Carolina going the right direction. He's going to do great things in Columbia. There is big things ahead of that program. He talked about Nicholas Harbor and the impact of landing him on the program. We talked about uh, spring football and what they're going to get done there and what they're hoping to get done there as they've lost a little bit via the portal. They've added some things via the portal, a new offense with Dow Loggins now calling the show. Talk to him about what we can expect offensively. A lot of great things talked about with Coach Beamer. We appreciate him taking time with us. Without further ado, Coach Shane Beamer. We are now joined by the head coach of South Carolina football, Coach Shane Beamer. Coach, appreciate you making time. How are we doing this morning? We're doing great, J.D. Thanks for having me on. 100%. And y'all are in the middle of like winter conditioning, kind of the, the dues-paying portion of college football, as I like to call it. Are you mixing it up in the, in the workout sessions? Are you getting mat drills? Are you, are you running all of that? Or what, what's going on there with you? Yeah, we're doing a little bit of everything. Uh, you know, it's great. The month of February is awesome. As much as I love recruiting, uh, it's great to be back in February because you get around your whole team for really the first time, uh, the whole staff and uh, being able to be invested in them each and every week, each and every day of the week. So we're doing our normal lifting workouts. We're doing the off season programs like everybody. We, we uh, you know, we, we're a little bit unique. We don't do it quite like a lot of schools with the mat drills and things like that. We're, we're uh, kind of do our own thing in, in those ways, but uh, each day trying to get better and, and uh, gearing into spring practices or gearing up for spring practice, which starts next month. And you're not jumping into those workouts, are you? I mean, you're not getting in there and mixing it up with Juice I've, Wells I've, uh, and Spencer Rattler. I've been I've been known to. Um, I'm not. Uh, I've been. They, they they've called me out a few times, and I've had to get in there and push sleds and carry uh, carry sandbags and things like that just to prove that I can. But I'm uh, I'm in the I'm in the facility each morning early uh, doing my own workouts. So the 7 a.m. lifting group, they see me in each day uh, struggling to try and get through it. So uh, they, they know that I am. Just making sure, hey, if, if push comes to shove, I, I can't put you all in your place if it comes to that. But yeah, 100%. No question. I don't know about putting in place, but I can definitely <laughs> jump in there and, and, uh, and, and, and hold my own. Apparently yesterday, we, we got an off-season workout tonight as a team. And Apparently yesterday, the strength coach uh, talked a couple of our graduate assistants into doing the workout that our players are doing tonight. And I think one of them did OK. And I think from what I understand, the other one ended up uh, not OK. So I, uh, I, I need to see the results of that. <laughs> yeah, winter workouts, they, uh, they take, take, take. But moving from, from winter workouts into spring football, what's the, the feel around the program right now, especially from the way that y'all finished the year with back-to-back -to -back top 10 wins and all the momentum that y'all had on the recruiting trail? Yeah, I'd say there's a lot of excitement, a lot of energy uh, in our program and, and outside our facility uh, as well. There's a lot of excitement about South Carolina football, and that's a testament to what we've done on the field. That's a testament to what we've done uh, in recruiting, uh, the number of the players that we have returning on, on this upcoming team in 2023. But uh, our guys are hungry. For sure, no one is satisfied with just uh, eight regular season wins. We all have higher goals than that. But we also understand the amount of work that it took to go from uh, two wins when I arrived to seven wins to eight wins. That a lot of work went into that, and there's going to take even more work to get to that next level, that 
beyond eight wins. And, uh, you know, we've got a hungry group that's eager to show that, that we're uh, not satisfied and, and love the way they're working right now. And a big part of that success and that strong finish last year was Juice Wells and Spencer Rattler were putting up just like video game kind of numbers, especially down the stretch there. What was your reaction when you found out not just Spencer Rattler, but Juice Wells were both going to be back in Columbia? Ah, uh, excitement, without a doubt. One, because they're great young men. Like, I love being around them. Spencer's awesome. He and I were obviously together at Oklahoma and, and uh, got a great relationship. And, and uh, Juice is just an awesome person, awesome personality, uh, does so many things for our program. So for those guys to be coming back as people, I was excited about, obviously. And then what they did on the field. They're two great players that make their teammates better. And we've got a lot of great pieces or great players coming back uh, around both those guys, which we're fired up about. But certainly uh, Spencer and Juice and the way they finished the season, uh, they really were playing as well as any wide receiver quarterback duo in the country. And uh, well, speaking we of, continue to, yeah, to absolutely. No, 100%. I didn't mean to cut you off there, coach. Uh, speaking of great players, though, y'all did land five-star athlete Nicholas Harbour sounds like he's going to play some wide receiver for y'all and what was the the statement that you feel like that made to the rest of the country by y'all landing a player of that caliber yeah that's it was huge and that goes right back to the the energy part that I think people feel across the country about South Carolina football I mean it was already high because we had just signed you know our, our highest rated recruiting class in, in over 10 years I believe um and we've had we had some success on the field during the regular season. So the excitement level was already high. But when you have a, a player the caliber of Nicholas uh, that's ranked as high as he is, but then he decides on national television where the whole country is uh, watching and the number of schools that we beat out for Nicholas when he decided to become a Gamecock. That just uh, it resonated with a lot of people. And, and most importantly, it resonated with other high school prospects that, that saw that. I mean, the minute that Nick committed, I got a ton of 2024 kids that are texting my phone excited about it as well. Uh, and what 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 the statement we made, you know, when, when Nick signed with us. Yeah, coach, I tell our viewers all the time, like I'm washed up. I, I no longer have any more eligibility. But if I had one more season, like I'm coming to play for you at South Carolina scholarship or not, like I'm finding a way to get in the door in Columbia. What contributes to that special culture and that energy that y'all have cultivated in house there? Well, I, I appreciate that. That means a lot. I'm sure you've got some eligibility. We'll find a role, a role for you. I know you've got a few plays left in you for sure. But <laughs> Um, you know, I think it's a lot of it's a lot of factors. One, it starts in recruiting with the type of people we're bringing into the program. We've got some great people in our program, players, coaches, staff. Uh, the passion that I think we all feel about coaching here and playing at South Carolina, we try and instill that in them, the, the gratitude that we want to have here to be about being a Gamecock. And then, you know, I'm a relationship person, and we use the word love in this program a lot. And it's not just a sign or a, on a wall or a door. It's, it's something that we try and live each and every day, the relationships that we have with our players. And it's it's we have a lot of fun in this program, but our players will be the first to tell you it's hard. It's demanding. They're held accountable. But it all starts with love and, and building just really, really strong relationships and trying to make this a place that, our coaches, our staff, our players look forward to coming into each and every day, meaning this facility that I'm in, coming in here and trying to get a little better. Coach, you had one of my favorite mic drop moments of, of the entire college football season after y'all beat Clemson and you essentially just told the whole media, hey, we're not just a good story. Like, I know y'all want to kind of put us in that category. We're not a feel-good story at South Carolina. In 2023, how are you measuring success for your football team? You know, I say it all the time, and I believe it to be the very, very best that we can be. And let's maximize the potential of the 2023 football season. And I know everybody wants me to put like a numerical number on that, how many wins we need and all that. And, and for me, it's just continuing to make progress. We haven't arrived uh, by any stretch of the imagination. we got a lot of work to do, but make progress, get a little better than where we are right now as a program, and then get the very most out of the 2023 team uh, that we can and 
you know, in 2022, we did a lot of really good things, but I feel like there's some things that we obviously, there's a lot of things that we could have done better and uh, let's continue to try and get better in 2023. And, and uh, you know, we got a brutal schedule, which we are excited about as competitors. And then at the end of the season, let's look up. And if I feel like we maximize the potential of uh, the, the, the group of young men that we have, then to me, that's a successful season. And you brought in Dow Loggins to call the offense, which was more press conference greatness, by the way. But when it comes to what fans can expect from the South Carolina offense next year, what made him the right fit? And what can they expect from that offense from an on-the-field perspective? Yeah, great question. I'm, uh, I'm excited about Dow and, and what he brings to the table. He's a great person. Um, you know, he's, he's shown in his short time in college football that he's a dynamic recruiter. He's been great. He did. He was a great recruiter at Arkansas, and he's been great in his short time here with us already uh, as well. But he was excited. To, he was an exciting person for me to bring into the program because of her recruiting ability, because of the person he is. But then his background is in the NFL. That's basically where he's been his entire career career. So being able to take the things that he did in the NFL, which was important for Spencer when Spencer made his decision to come back, that we were not going to get too far away from, you know, a pro style type offense. But the thing that excites me about Dow is he's now been at Arkansas for two seasons in that system that they're running at Arkansas, which is different than most NFL teams, obviously. Uh, and I think Dow has been able to take the good and the bad from both of them and really blend it to, to be a kind of a, you know, a, 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 I don't want to say cutting edge, but an offense that blends pro style elements along with the college up tempo spread type systems as well. And, and then at the end of the day, we're going to do what best fits our players here at Carolina and the personnel that, that we have. But, you know, he's got a background, Dow does, coaching quarterbacks, whether it be veterans like Matt Hasselbeck or rookies like Sam Darnold. And, and being able to, you know, work with quarterbacks was appealing to me. And then obviously Spencer uh, as well, uh, deciding to come back. A big part of that was the relationship he developed in a short time with Dow also. Coach, what's the goal for your team as you head into spring football? Like what's the number one thing you want to get accomplished during those 15 practices? Yeah, you know this, J.D., like every year is starting over in, in college football because you just don't return players like you used to. Obviously, you have you lose guys to the NFL. You lose guys uh, that graduate. Guys, unfortunately, you know, or fortunately, unfortunately, depending on the situation for them, uh, decide to transfer. So we brought in a bunch of new players. So for me, it's really just trying to instill – how we do things because there are so many new faces here uh, that weren't a part of Carolina football last season. So let's instill, you know, the mentality and the toughness and the physicality that we want to practice with. And, and we've got to learn a new system offensively, you know, so there's a lot of things uh, from that standpoint. And, and then obviously like everybody, we've got to, you know, ID some, some spots. We lost three starters on the offensive line. Who's going to step up at that position? We lost both of our starters at defensive end. Who steps up there? Um, you know, so we've got – we lost both of our starting corners. Who, who are the next guys to step up? So there's some, some awesome, you know, position battles and opportunities that I'm eager to see. But more than anything, it's just instilling, you know, how we do things uh, with, the, with the new faces here and then trying to get better and, and obviously stay healthy. Coach, last question before I let you go. Appreciate all your time. You've gone viral now, not just once, but like three or four times. I know you've talked about Justin King and the phenomenal job he does in y'all's creative department, but I just got to know, does it feel good off the hand when you walk out of those tapings, if you will? Like, do you know you're about to go viral when you get out of those sessions? <laughs> um, not always, because Justin is, obvious, is honestly probably pretty more in tune with – things than I am, you know, I mean, I, the soldier boy video last summer, like we did that. And I had no idea it was going to be as big as, as what it was. Um, you know, obviously I, I knew the song and I knew soldier boy, but the, the impact that it was going to have, I had no idea. Like, for example, we did that video literally 20 minutes before I got on a plane to fly to Atlanta for SEC media day. And we finished the video Justin posted it and tweeted it out. And the amount of messages I had on my phone within five minutes was like, oh, my God, uh, this is a really, really big deal. And even still 
to this day, JD, like recruits will visit us that are here for the first time and they'll pull their phones out and some of them like have it on their phone as like a screensaver and things like that. So it's uh, that's really the people that I'm you know trying to impact. But, you know, some of them, you know, each of them's different as well. But no, to be honest with you, the magnitude that some of them, some of them have had, I don't always think about. But, you know, I'm blessed to be in this position that I'm in. I love what I do. I'm going to have fun. This is a really, really demanding and stressful job. There's no question about it, but I love what I get to do each and every day and the people I get to do it with. So I'm, I'm going to be me, not trying to be somebody I'm not and, and, and have fun as long as I'm here. Well, that Soldier Boy video, that was the moment where I was like, I'm running through a brick wall for that guy, 100%. I don't care how thick it is, I'm running through that brick wall. But coach, appreciate you taking so much time with us this morning. Best of luck as you head into the spring and we're looking forward to hopefully seeing y'all uh, and Willie be here in the fall. Yep, look forward to it. Appreciate you and all you do for college football and hope to be on again soon. Coach Shane Beamer, one of the best in the business. I'm telling y'all, South Carolina, if you wanted to pick a dark horse out of the SEC to make some noise, the way they finished the year, beating Tennessee, beating Clemson, in both games they were double-digit underdogs. If that is a small sample size of what we can expect in 2023 from that team, Spencer Rattler and Juice Wells, if they get clicking like that again, I'm just saying – They've got that ain't no telling factor. I've said it before. We just can't count them out. They've got a lot of things that you just can't put on tape and you can't put a number to the culture. Like Coach Beamer talked about, that culture in Columbia, South Carolina is special. Again, we appreciate Coach Beamer jumping on with us. A lot of other guests on the way. I'll just say that. If we get to, let's say we get 25 more likes on this bad boy, we will tell y'all who our next guest is. Already have him lined up. So go ahead and hit the thumbs up button on this video. And if you get there at the end of this thing, we'll tell you who we have on deck next. Now let's stay in the SEC. We just had Coach Beamer on. Let's stay in the SEC conversation. It's no secret the format, the scheduling format is going to change a little bit here. Oklahoma and Texas headed to the SEC in 2024. There's a lot of things changing in 2024 across the college football landscape. But that just sort of got me thinking. With the schedule changing, what rivalries do we need to protect? And now there's a lot of conversation around what divisions could look like or if divisions just go away as a whole. It's very possible. But if we were to just say, what rivalries between SEC East and SEC West teams do we want to protect? I got a couple of them for you right here. And the first one we need to protect is the third Saturday in October. Tennessee and Alabama. Now, I fully expect this to be protected, but think about it this way. This rivalry to me embodies so perfectly what is unique about college football. Like you got the cigar smoke floating over where whatever stadium it's being played at. No other sport does that happen. No other sport do you have 100 plus people in uniform, much less in the stands, just smoking stogies after getting a big W. That doesn't happen anywhere else. You need to protect this rivalry. It's like you don't go and build a parking lot over the Redwoods. The Redwoods are beautiful. The Redwoods are specific to America. You hear what I'm saying? If you build a parking lot over the third Saturday in October, it's un-American. Met 105 total times. It just embodies everything about college football that we love. Even if you're not an Alabama or Tennessee fan, you would be, I believe, disappointed to see a special traditional rivalry like that be thrown by the wayside. Again, an SEC East and SEC West teams, I hope and believe this will be protected, but I just want to have it out on the record. Us here at the Hard Count, we are starting our own petition to say, protect the third Saturday in October. It's a rivalry that is just legitimately labeled by when it's played. A lot of these other rivalries have cool names around them, Third Saturday in October just tells you, yeah, this is when we're meeting up. This is when we're playing. Pretty special. If you haven't yet subscribed to the On3 YouTube channel, The Hard Count is live twice a week. We do content on this channel every single day. Come be a part of it. Also, follow me on Instagram and on Twitter at JD Piquel. I want to hear from y'all. I want to hear who y'all want on the show as a guest. I want to hear what y'all want talked about on future episodes. It's a great medium for us to hear from you. Also, get in the chat right now and let us hear from you. Appreciate you in advance. Another rivalry, or rivalries rather, that we need to address. How about the Texas Longhorns? They have not one, but two rivalries that I think we really need to make sure that are consistently being played. 
And when I say protect for all these rivalries, I'm saying we play them on an annual basis. It's not, okay, every four years we play them, every other year we play them. No, I want these games every single year when it comes to the college football season. The two that we got to protect, Oklahoma and Texas A&M. We'll start with Oklahoma. This game is played, obviously, Texas State Fair. You don't have Christmas without the Christmas tree. You don't have the Texas State Fair without Texas and OU in the Red River rivalry. It would just feel wrong. It just it, it would feel so weird. Again, I expect this 1,000% to be protected, but I'm telling you, if we were to somehow just swing and whiff horrifically as a college football society and didn't have this rivalry being played, I think people would riot. I truly believe that. Both these fan bases are... Historic to blue blood programs, you got to play this game every year. And if we don't, we have whiffed horrifically, again, as a college football public. The other game that I was just talking about, Texas and Texas A&M. Now, we haven't played this one in a little bit because A&M said, deuces, we're out to the SEC. And Texas said, okay, we're coming too. And everyone in College Station was like, huh? No, this is our thing. We, we do this whole SEC thing. Imagine when they play each other for the first time again just how intense that environment is going to be. Whenever that day is down on paper, I promise you I have it circled, underlined, starred. I will do everything in my power physically to be within that stadium, whether it's at College Station, whether it's at DKR. Whenever these teams meet up, it will be historic. If they don't meet up on an annual basis, then why did Texas even go to the SEC, man? If we don't get the Lone Star Showdown every single year, why is Texas going to the Southeastern Conference, right? Like, this is just a golden opportunity. Let's not mess it up. Let's not outthink the room here. Let's use common sense. Texas plays OU every year. Texas plays Texas A&M every year. We all on the same page? We're all happy? Cool. It's rock and roll. Georgia-Auburn, the Deep South's oldest rivalry. If we were to do away with this rivalry, we're doing away with history. With all these rivalries, yes, but with this rivalry, especially their first meeting was in 1892. There's so many great moments in all these rivalries. This one especially, prayer at Jordan-Hare, that was special. The thing that I think I, I want to emphasize the most with keeping this rivalry intact, if you were to eliminate this rivalry, you are cutting a common thread throughout history that so many families and friendships and relationships have bonded over. Your great-grandfather might have been at this game when he went to Auburn, and you get to watch it right now as well as a first-year student at Auburn. And it's still Georgia Auburn. It's still the Deep South's oldest rivalry. That's a special thing, man. This is a special tie. You don't want to cut this common thread throughout college football history for a lot of people. Again, Deep South's oldest rivalry, it needs to continue. You don't want to mess with history too much. This rivalry that I want to talk about next is one that if you scan the internet for different projected, protected rivalries, I say protected in air quotes, because we don't know what it's going to look like yet, this is one that is not on a lot of the boards, not on a lot of the, the hot lists. The Swamp Bowl between LSU and Florida needs to be preserved. Similar to what I said about the third Saturday in October, it's just unique to college football. Like, we previewed this game on the On3 YouTube channel during the season, live on the hard count. Rock with us if you haven't already. We previewed it, and the same thing kept coming up when I talked to different individuals who cover LSU or who cover Florida, and they just kept saying the same thing. Hey, man, weird things happen in this game. Things that nobody can really explain or predict or put adequately into words. It just happens in LSU, Florida. It just happens in the Swamp Bowl. Like, for example, Marco Wilson picking up an LSU player's shoe and just putting his entire body and soul into it as he hucked it across the field, drawing a penalty that eventually led to LSU winning the game and Florida being left out of the college football playoff. That doesn't happen in other rivalries. Not saying it wouldn't happen, but LSU Florida is a unique point in our game that needs to be kept sacred, kept special. If for no other reason, right now, the series is dead even all time. You got 33 and 33 and three. It's a whole lot of threes. Three ties in this game. Like, what are we talking about here? It's a bizarre 
game whenever it happens. We got a bizarre sport. Keep college football weird. Keep the Swamp Bowl a part of what we have, all right? So I want to protect the third Saturday in October. I want to protect Texas's rivalries with A&M and Oklahoma. I want the Deep South to continue to roll with Georgia and Auburn. And I also want the Swamp Bowl with LSU Florida to be protected. So all of those rivalries need to be played on a consistent basis. The reason why I mentioned them outside of Texas and OU and Texas, Texas A&M, these are SEC East versus SEC West rivalries. Now, I'm not saying the divisions are going to stay intact, but with, ever, with whatever the schedule looks like, whether you go to nine conference games, whether you go to eight conference games, I hope it's nine conference games, whatever it looks like, you got to keep these rivalries, man. Don't mess with the fabric of our sport. Keep it sacred. Keep the rules as they are. Keep these rivalries intact. And the ones with Texas A&M and Texas, keep those intact in the future when you do start playing. So that's my 10 cents on that. I'm telling you, the SEC special conference, special conference, special games being played in that. What do they say? It just means more. That's what they say. Get in the chat right now and let me know what rivalry you want to have preserved. Let me know. Also, we're getting closer to that number with the likes. If you would like that video, I think we need about 10 more likes and we'll be in good shape. 10 more likes and then we will tell you who the next guest is for the hard count. It's going to air on Thursday. And if you want to know, just go ahead and hit the like button and we'll make sure that happens for you. All right. There is a list that came out on on3.com was also on the on3 Twitter page talking through the top 10 players in all of college football heading into the 2023 season. Now, I want to break it down for you. One through 10. Here's what we got. At number one, you got Caleb Williams. Number two, you got Drake May. Number three, you have Marvin Harrison Jr. Number four, you got Brock Bowers. Number five, we have Jared Verse. Number six, Michigan's running back Blake Corum. Number seven, Harold Perkins. Number eight, Olu Fashanu. Joe Alt from Notre Dame is at number nine. Number 10, Kool-Aid McKentry, the DB at Alabama. Now, this is the top 10 heading into the season from our staff here at On3. As we look to the future, though, I think there's a couple of these guys that are in good position to shoot up this list and finish a lot higher than where they are right now. Again, this is just a preseason list that the staff over here at On3 developed. I've got some thoughts on this, but really quickly, if you haven't yet subscribed to this program, We'd love to have you on the On3 YouTube channel. We'd love to have you subscribe to our party. Also, follow me on Instagram and on Twitter, at J.D. Pakel. If you're a podcast person, maybe you're listening on podcast right now, we salute you. Whether you're driving to work, listening at lunch, however you're hearing this, we appreciate y'all locking in. Make sure you leave a five-star review, subscribe, and all that. But we appreciate y'all bringing the juice on podcast, man. Podcast does not get enough love. Say it all the time. But back to this list, the pass catcher specifically, Marvin Harrison Jr. at three, Brock Bowers at four. I think that we need to keep a really close eye on them. Brock Bowers is at four. I wouldn't be surprised if he finished number one. I wouldn't be surprised if Marvin Harrison finished number one. The reason for that being, both of these cats are matchup nightmares, and that gets thrown around probably too loosely in modern college football, but that's just emphatically the truth with these two guys. Run like gazelles are both six foot three plus that blend of size and speed that is just so difficult to account for and the reason why you're seeing longer corners the reason why you're seeing bigger safeties to try and account for a brock bowers and a marvin harrison jr they're gonna have huge numbers this year again because they have a new quarterback in athens georgia and columbus ohio maybe you're saying wait a second new quarterback jd wouldn't they have worse production because the guy throwing them the rock maybe isn't as capable I could hear your argument there, but my thought process is, okay, you have someone who's really talented pulling the trigger, whether it's Kyle McCord or Devin Brown at Ohio State, whether it's Gunnar Stockton, whether it's Carson Beck, Brock Vandergriff at Georgia, you're going to have somebody who has a ton of ability at quarterback at both of those programs. And guess what else? They are going to depend on their safety blanket the duration of the season as a first-year starter. Like when things get crazy in Athens, Georgia, the play breaks down and Carson Beck has to scramble to his right and it's fourth down, you need a first down, you need a touchdown, whatever it is. Who is the football going to? It's going to your best player, Brock Bowers. Same situation in Columbus. It's going to your freak show, Marvin Harrison Jr., who won Freak of the Year, actually, for the program awards here on the hard count. If you know, you know. These guys are going to put up huge numbers this year. I think it could even be more so than what you saw a season ago because of what I just said. 
they are going to depend whoever's playing quarterback on these guys consistently. Also, both these dudes, I promise you, would be high draft picks if they were eligible right now. They're going to have a whole other offseason to go through the strength conditioning programs at their respective schools to get more comfortable in their playbooks. I'd be surprised if Mike Bobo, the new OC at Georgia, I'd be surprised if it is not get Brock Bowers the football. I don't care how we do it. All right, that's going to be the playbook in Athens, Georgia. I just told you what they're going to do the duration of the year. So Brock Bowers, Marvin Harrison Jr. at three and four right now. I would not be surprised in the slightest if they finished one and two. Now on the defensive side of things, you got Harold Perkins at seven. You got Jared Verse at five. Harold Perkins, just a freshman last year. Like a, a year, year and a half ago, my mind's at prom. Instead, he goes and tears up the SEC a year after his high school career. I mean, he, he is a dude. I want to start with him. He can play so many places within this LSU defense. And credit Matt House, the D.C. at LSU, for finding a role for him. Because remember, number 40, Tasmanian Devil, he wasn't seeing the field super early in the year. Some of that could be, hey, we just got to find a spot for you. Some of that could be, we need you to get comfortable in our defense. But he is someone you can play at linebacker. You can play him at nickel and put him out in the slot. You can put him at stand-up defensive end. Like, he is so flexible with... For Matt House, that allows him to pick his matchups. Hey, Harold, this week, man, we want you on the slot. We'll blitz you out of there. We'll put you in zone. That's the, ble- that's the best place for you to play from. Or maybe it's, hey, Harold, this offensive tackle, man, he's not that fast, does not get out of his stance well. We like the matchup with you on this tackle. We're going to give you a couple of blitz packages during this game. To be able to move him around like a chess piece for LSU, you saw the benefit of that time and time and again for the Tigers, especially the Arkansas game. Like that game was low scoring. It was cold. It was after a huge win for LSU. That was a huge letdown spot for the Tigers. And had Harold Perkins not just called game blouses himself, I think he had something like Uh, two forced fumbles. I think he got to the quarterback a couple of times. Like he put on a clinic in that game. And you saw the way that they lined him up, the chess piece that he was as a freshman. That doesn't happen in college football. So to even be on this list as a freshman heading into his sophomore year says something, but what he could be for the future at LSU and this coming year, keep an eye on him. Keep an eye on Harold Perkins. There's going to be a lot of people during the offseason talking about a defensive player, who would it be if they were to win the Heisman? Harold Perkins is going to be at the top of that list for the reasons I just mentioned. A special player, a special piece for that defense. Now, Jared Verse came from Albany. Mike Norvell doing what Mike Norvell does, goes to the portal, gets him a dude in Jared Verse, and Jared Verse popped this coming season, or this past season. Had a total of nine sacks, and the defensive line for Florida State, Jared Verse included, wasn't always healthy. He played through pain, did Jared Verse. The scary thing that means for the opposition is he probably still has more in the tank. There's probably more that Jared Verse is capable of that we didn't get to see on tape in 2022. If Florida State accomplishes what they want to accomplish, winning the ACC, playing for the college football playoff, it will in large part be because of the efforts of Jared Verse. He's going to be a game wrecker this coming year. He's still getting acclimated to FBS football. He was playing at the FCS level at Albany. Okay, to make that jump is something in itself. Now to get a whole offseason under your belt, to go into the season as the guy, to not be the best kept secret anymore, even if Jared Verse doesn't stuff the stat sheet like I anticipate he will, even if for whatever reason he doesn't end up making a ton of plays, it'll be because teams are having to double team him. And you double team Jared Verse, somebody else is getting loose. Somebody else is getting to the quarterback. Just having him on this defense makes them better. The trenches will get better at Florida State this coming year just from being healthy. If he can stay healthy, Jared Verse, another guy that you will just have to account for. He's number five on this list, but he's going to be a problem. A huge piece for what Florida State wants to do in 2023 and will be a huge reason why they accomplish what they accomplish. So on the defensive side, those two cats, I'm telling you, keep an eye on them because they have a very strong potential to finish higher than they are at right now. Now, obviously, quarterback position, most important position in all of sports. 
And at one and two, respectively, we got Caleb Williams from USC, the reigning Heisman Trophy winner, and Drake May at number two. Let's we'll start with Caleb Williams. I don't know how you put him anywhere outside of number one to start the season, at least after coming back to school with a Heisman Trophy in his apartment in Los Angeles on the mantle. I'm sure it looks nice when he has company over and says, hey, guys, at the Heisman Trophy. Ever seen one of those? Didn't think so really quickly. I have to go to math class. Like, just a ridiculous situation to be in if you're Caleb Williams. And the question you would have for someone like him is, okay, well, how does he do for an encore in 2023? How does he do now? He's a ton of pressure. He's got a bullseye on his back. Y'all, I don't know if we adequately recall how he was being talked about heading into the season. There were a ton of people talking about Caleb Williams being a front runner for the Heisman Trophy before he even started a full season at USC. All the talk was what USC was capable of and how much pressure was on Caleb Williams. He had a bullseye on his back in Los Angeles before the year even started. So, yeah, there's some pressure being the reign and Heisman Trophy winner, but I'm telling you, on the biggest stage, Caleb Williams just continues to deliver. And maybe your rebuttal to that is, well, hey, J.D., look at what happened in the Pac-12 title game. Look at what happened in the New Year's Six Bowl game against Tulane. He didn't deliver there. Wrong, wrong. He did deliver there, actually. He was hurt against Utah and still put on a show. The thing that's going to hold USC back is USC's defense. I think Caleb Williams is more than capable of winning another Heisman Trophy. I'll just put that out there right now. I think that if you were to have a favorite that you were to bet on right now, Caleb Williams, it's fair to assume that he's that guy to be because he is that guy to be. So I've seen him multiple times live up to the spotlight and shine in that spotlight. I'm not super worried about a drop-off for him in 2023. Now, Drake May is the one that I want to focus on. Does he have any other help around him? He's a special player. There was a lot of buzz around, is he going to get out of the portal? Or is someone going to poach him and make him jump into the portal and, and get him over to whatever other program that wants him? Special talent. I think the thing that could hold him back is, who else is around Drake May right now? Who else is around Drake May that's going to be his go-to receiver or the defense was really bad last year. That's the reason why they didn't win the ACC. Like, Drake May is special, but he's only one player. Are we going to see his potential capped by the talent around him at UNC? I'm not knocking UNC. If you just look at the recruiting rankings, though, that's kind of the reality. UNC is really good, but we saw that the gap between UNC and Clemson is pretty sizable. I think the gap between UNC and Florida State also pretty sizable. So Drake may deserve to be at number two. I am very curious to see how he plays this coming season with more pressure on him. He's a known commodity now. It's not going to be Drake may sneaking up on anybody. So again, the top 10 for us, Caleb Williams at one, Drake may at two, Marvin Harrison Jr. at three, Brock Bowers at four, Jared verse at five, Blake Corum at six. We didn't really get a chance to touch on. He's going to be a dog. Harold Perkins at seven, Olufashanu at tackle for Penn State is number eight. Joe Alt, also a tackle from Notre Dame, will be a high draft pick. He's at number nine. Then Kool-Aid McKentry, the corner from Alabama, rounds out the top ten. I want to hear your thoughts on this, though. Get in the chat. Let me know what you think. And let us know who's left out of this top ten. Who, who are we not talking about yet? Maybe someone who's going to jump into the top ten by the time the season really gets rolling here. But the top 10 players in college football, that's what they are right now. Those are my thoughts. Keep an eye on those guys. I think they have a really good chance to move up in those rankings. All right, y'all, we're pretty close here. We get a few more likes. We will tell y'all who we have next up on the hard count, okay? Again, that is airing Thursday. We got a special guest. Already got it lined up. It's in the queue. Like this video, and, and we'll, uh, we'll drop the news. But now getting to some of y'all's questions, some of y'all's thoughts and concerns. We'll bring on the keeper of the queue, the heavy lifter extraordinaire, Nick Brake. Nick. What's going on, my guy? How we doing? What's up, man? I'm a little out of focus all of a sudden. Um, you look good, man. I think I'll come back into focus in you a second. Um, you look good to me. You look good to me. But uh, anyway, uh, let's get some questions, like you said. Uh, first one coming from Daniel Johnson. Are the South Carolina Gamecocks the biggest SEC dark horse going into the season? Dude? Man, we had, we had Shane Beamer on. I, I firmly believe Spencer Rattler coming back. Juice Wells coming back. They've lost some things in the portal. When all the dust settles, they will be a have rather than a have not in the portal. 
I absolutely think South Carolina is. That might be a segment we do in the future, Nick, talking about some SEC sleepers. They, uh, they're definitely one of those teams. Definitely a dark horse. Now, they've got their work cut out for them in the schedule. Got to play Georgia early. Got to play Clemson at the end of the year. So it's not going to be an easy route by any stretch, but South Carolina 1,000% should be considered a dark horse to win the SEC, to at least play in Atlanta for the SEC. I mean, good night. It's, it's a brutal conference, Nick, but keep an eye on Shane Beamer. Never count him out, man. Also, folks, we're close. Hit that like button. We'll let you know who we got on for our next guest for yeah. the hard count. What I else we got, Big Nick? I don't even know who our next guest is. <laughs> so uh, that would be hey, nice to find out. We get a few more likes, people. We'll, we'll let Nick break know as well. <laughs> um, we'll, all, we'll all find out together. This is a, Buffalo, a big reveal. This is a Buffalo's um, – Colorado-centric question from Buffalo Soldier um, at Prime on Pearl. What's a jersey color that we need to see more of? Yeah, this is a good question. How often do we see yellow, Nick? I don't think we see enough yellow. I mean, I, we see a lot of red, see a lot of blue, a lot of green. I don't see enough yellow. So if I had to, if I had to answer that, I would say yellow. Nick, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Is there a jersey color that is not seen enough around college football. Oh, I don't think there's near enough maroon in the SEC. Um, no. You got Mississippi State? No, I'm just – Oh, I'm, you're joking. I'm being oh, very okay. sincere. That's every team in the SEC. Um, you sicko, Nick Break. You know, you look at the big teams, there's not a lot of just royal blue. Yeah, that's true. Like Kentucky are the biggest team, I feel like, that wear royal blue on a regular basis. So and it's like the most, you know, common color. Kentucky is smooth, man. The royal blue is good. I'm with you. I think yellow and royal blue need to be talked about. Mm -hmm. Y'all, it is the time of year where uniforms become a little bit more talked about. We're not really a uniform channel, but we got to give our thoughts on that. When y'all want to know about it, we'll talk about it. Uh, what, what about that, Nick? We got anything else on the, on the docket here? Got one more. Beautiful. City or Buff City, does Washington and Oregon, or do Washington and Oregon need to move out of the Pac-12 to stay relevant? Could a move to the Big 12 or Big 10 even be possible for these two schools? Yes, I'm glad that we're talking about this. I listened back to our podcast from the Thursday show. One of y'all asked us the same question, and I just started talking about something that wasn't this question. So appreciate y'all rocking with us being patient. Does Oregon and Washington need to move out of the Pac-12 to be relevant? There's a couple of ways to look at this. On one hand, if you're Oregon and Washington – you're probably carrying a pretty substantial amount of the load from a revenue standpoint within the Pac-12. So you look around and say, huh, I'm doing a lot of work here. Do I need to stick around? Is it best for me to stick around when I'm lifting more than the rest of my counterparts? Maybe I can go cash in elsewhere, say the Big Ten. Maybe I can cash in in the Big 12. And, okay, the, the Pac-12, if we don't add other teams, which you hope they do, the media, right, the media rights thing is struggling right now or – allegedly struggling right now because nobody really knows anything on that. Um, in short, I would say they don't have to, but that would be the thought process to where it would make sense to make some more money. Now, the other way to look at this, remember the Pac-12 and college football in general is entering into the expansion era. So we're going to get a 12-team playoff here pretty soon. I would be surprised with USC and UCLA leaving to the Big Ten here very soon, 2024, when the playoff becomes expanded Oregon and Washington along with Utah are going to be in pretty good position I think to be some of the top dogs in that conference and if you win the Pac-12 you're going to have an auto bid into the college football playoff so in that way maybe you say okay we don't make as much in media money during the regular season or just kind of our allotted assigned dollar figure but when it comes to what we could do if we make the college football playoff and make some noise there maybe there's some you know, risk reward there. So keep an eye on that. I do fully believe that we will have a uh, more movement within the Pac-12, but Oregon and Washington, two schools that I think a lot of other conferences will be excited to grab. Now, I saw in the, in the chat, we reached our desired number of likes. So one, thank you to y'all. We threw out the challenge. Y'all met that challenge with flying colors, so thank you for that. The next guest for the hard count will be none other than Clemson running back Will Shipley. 
Okay, so we're excited to have Will on. We're going to chop it up, talk Clemson football, talk a little about his journey, talk about the feel around Clemson right now as they move into spring football out of winter conditioning. Remember, a lot of changes around Clemson, South Carolina. Got Garrett Riley being the OC. Dabo Sweeney feels like he's always getting criticism whenever they don't win a national title. So we'll talk to Will, get his thoughts, feelings, concerns. Very excited for that conversation. But Will Shipley is the next guest up on the hard count. How about that, Nick? I'll be there. There you go. Hey, you and me both, man. You and me both. What do we say, Thursday? We'll hang out? Same, yeah, same time. <laughs> there we go, man. There we go. Well, folks, any, any other uh, questions on here, Nick, before we, we get out of here? Uh, no, that's it. Um, did have someone – I'll have to pull it up again. Uh, Wesley Weeks was saying that Texas A&M and LSU uh, was a good rivalry uh, to keep going on. In the that SEC. is a good rivalry. Um, that's a very – yeah, I mean, that's fair. To be honest, that's one of those rivalries that – has sort of become more and more relevant mm -hmm. in recent history. But I'm saying if there was one that you wanted to bet on and like, hey, we're going to kind of buy low, sell high with this rivalry and kind of keep it going and keep it intact, that's one of those that has been really entertaining over the last several years. One of you also jumps in the chat and says, how is Jordan Travis not on this list? My question would be, who are you dropping, right? I think it's very fair that Jordan Travis is a top 10 kind of player, but who would you drop from this list? It's tricky. It's very tricky. But I think at the end of the year, as we move forward, Jordan Travis could absolutely find his way into that top 10 territory. But, Nick, appreciate you, man, holding it down. And we'll do this again on Thursday. What do you say? Let's do it. Awesome. Again, Nick, break keeper of the queue, doing everything that you see here, part of this beautiful program on the On3 YouTube channel. Subscribe if you have not already. Huge, huge shout-out to y'all listening on podcast, whether it's on your morning commute, whether you're eating lunch at work, whether you are irresponsibly babysitting and just got your AirPods in while the kids are over there playing with things they shouldn't be playing with, we're glad that you're locked in with us. We're glad that y'all have allowed us to have the off-season, quote-unquote, that we have had so far. Very excited for the future. Very excited for the future. Very much so believing the best is yet to come. Will Shipley will be back on the program here on Thursday with our conversation with him. A little one-on-one -on -one action. But appreciate y'all rocking with us. Appreciate all that y'all have allowed us to do so far. We appreciate y'all. We love y'all. We're going to keep the party rolling. And we will see y'all next time.